ओम अज्ञान ज्ञानंजन शलाकाय चक्षुरी येन थस्म श्री गुरव नम वंदे गुरूंदीश भक्ताशाशावता प्रकाशा चक्ति कृष्ण चैतन्य संयक माई डियर मदर ओ डॉटर ऑफ स्वयं भूव मनो द टाइम फैक्टर एस आई हैव एक्सप्लेन इज द सुप्रीम पर्सनैलिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड फ्रॉम होम द क्रिएशन बिगिन्स एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ द एजिटेशन ऑफ द न्यूट्रल अनमेनिफेस्टेड नेचर प्रपोर्ट The unmanifested state of material nature, pradhan, is being explained. The Lord says that when the unmanifested material nature is agitated by the glance of the supreme personality of Godhead, it begins to manifest itself in different ways. Before this agitation, it remains in the neutral state, without interaction by the three modes of material nature. In other words, material nature cannot produce any variety. of manifestations without the contact of the supreme personality of godhead this is very nicely explained in bhagavad gita the supreme personality of godhead is the cause of the products of material nature without his contact material nature cannot produce anything in the chaitanya charitamrita also a very suitable example is given in this connection although the nipples on a goat's neck appear to be breast nipples they do not give milk have you all seen that there are many goats in bengal you seen nipples on the neck of a goat have you seen ajja gala stananya that's called the logic of the nipples on the neck of a goat it appears to be one thing but it's it appears to have some function but it doesn't similarly material nature appears to a material scientist to act and react in a wonderful manner but in reality it cannot act without the agitator time who is the representation of the supreme personality of godhead when time agitates the neutral state of material nature material nature begins to produce varieties of manifestations Ultimately it is said that the supreme personality of godhead is the cause of creation as a woman cannot produce children unless impregnated by a man material nature cannot produce or manifest anything unless it is impregnated by the supreme personality of godhead in the form of the time factor this is highly technical subject how do you say technical in bengali What's the translation of that? Who's translating? Oh well, I guess we don't have to worry about it. If no one's translating, it, we don't have to worry. And usually, or quite often, when devotees are giving class on these topics, they talk about it for two or three minutes and then change to Gaur Lila or Krishna. Somehow or other, they manage to change the topic or something. But Shila Prabhupad, he. lectured on kapila dev's instructions including those on sankhya yoga uh, which this chapter is a continuation of the analysis of the material elements and the material world shila prabhupad spoke on these subjects at length he, for many days in juhu in bombay he spoke on these subjects elaborating them in in a technical way and he was very interested that this lectures be transcribed and edited and published as a book which eventually happened quite a few years after prabhupad's departure that's the teachings of lord kapila prabhupad was very interested in this he, he didn't find it dry or uninteresting or boring he was interested to present bhagavat tatva vigyanam scientific knowledge of the personality of godhead he could see that anyone can see you know prabhupad yeah, as a preaching strategy aimed at the the underlying 
principles of the the present predominant misunderstandings in the world. I mean, the, the underlying principle of the, the material world at any time is Ami nitto krishna das e kota bhule mayar na for haya chirodin bhule Forgetting that we're the servants of Krishna, we wander eternally in this material world. So that's the basic principle, but different civilizations in human history have different worldviews on which they sustain their forgetfulness of Krishna. And they do quite a good job, actually. I mean, it's like in the West, we never, we never even heard of Krishna. They really f- forgot Krishna very well. You have to commend them. <laughs> they're, not, they're successful demons. Dushkriti, that word is there in Bhagavad Gita. Kriti means someone who does something successful. So they're successful. They're very successful in forgetting Krishna. They, you have to commend them in a reverse way for forgetting Krishna. So the present world civilization, for want of a better word, or to use the word that's commonly used, <coughs> civilization. It's not really civil, but it's called civilization. When people live together and don't... When they're dressed in factory-produced clothes, they call that civilization. That's the test of a civilization. Bhaktivedya Purna Maharaj, he was once saying that in a real civilization, people... It can be judged by how people pass too. That they go out into the field with a pot of water. They don't pass stool next to the kitchen. That's modern life. Everyone wants attached bathrooms. They think it's very advanced. But actually it's contaminated. And you have to have a whole elaborate sewage system so that you take the stool out of the water and then send it back for people to cook their, their rice in so that it becomes more stool and then it goes back. So in the big cities of the world you get water that's been through someone's intestines 20 times and we use it for archaman also. What's the alternative? Water out of a plastic bottle. It's also immediately contaminated. So Kali Yuga is right. Anyway, I'm getting off the topic. Civilization. The underlying basis of modern civilization is the scientific what shall we call it? Edifice. The big show of science that the universe has come into being by chance and life has come into being by chance and that means there's no God in control. And the whole world and is going on on that principle which means that... Uh, what is that? Asatyam apratishtam te jagadahura nishvaram aparaspara sambhutam kimanyat kama haitukam They say that there is there's no ultimate principle of reality. There's no controller or God. I was reading an article recently how by evolutionary theory they're trying to explain how, why do people believe in God? They're trying to analyze it that well, they can't fi- it's difficult for them to find any evolutionary reason according to their theory of evolution. So they say that it might be just some kind of quirk, some, some oddity that remains, that has no particular use. There's no use for it for the species, but anyway it's there. We can't really explain it, but they're trying to find some imaginative explanations of why Human beings believe in God and it's some kind of leftover from some previous phase. They, they imagine that they were cavemen hitting each other 
on the head with clubs and then at, after they hit each other on the head with clubs they go and pray to God or something like that anyway their idea is that there's no God in control there's no ultimate principle asatyam apratishtam te jagadahorni that aparaspara sambhutam this can be translated as more or less that everything has come into being by chance is that a good translation aparaspara there's no there's no mutual interaction or planning sambhutam means coming into being so it's amazing in bhagavad gita lord krishna he's well it's not really amazing because maya has stereotyped ways in one sense she has unlimited ways of working but they follow a general template so that we find that this nirvishesha shunyavad it's not something new this this mayavad theory of shankara acharya it's not something that he invented newly it, in every in every creation of brahma there are mayavadis bad luck for the human society there are mayavadi all these kind of philosophies sankhya philosophy karnad atom theory mimamsa all the, it comes again and again so people think that we've made wonderful this we have these wonderful theories that everything is coming to being by chance but in bhagavad gita lord krishna is already speaking about the demoniac it's it's an inherent demoniac tendency to think that there is no god and everything is coming to being by chance and that they are trying to present it as science and uh, that that it's it's something proven of course they can never prove it but it the only thing that it really proves is that they're demons they fit the description of bhagavad gita aparaspara sambhutam kimanyat kaima kama haitukam and then the net result is that simply lust increases it's everything the whole society is based on lust many times devotees ask them well they used to ask when people used to read books but in the in the teachings of lord chaitanya propad notes that or comments that lord shiva he came as shankaracharya and one of one of the purposes of him coming as shankaracharya one of the negative results of spreading this mayavad is that an increased population unwanted population so if you say well how does mayavad increase population you think everyone would just kind of do nothing and or just meditate on the the light emanating from themselves which they see everywhere but what actually happens is that mayavad it's so so much opposite to the actual nature of the soul which is to love krishna that the that this completely impersonal idea that there's there's no uh, again the aparaspara there's no mutual interaction of people it it becomes uh, or well, people are not really people because we're all just part of the oneness and personality is imagined so people think like this but still they have the strong desires to enjoy sense gratification so they do that in an unregulated way and because they have they think there's there's no mayavad comes to the same thing even though they speak of ishvara they don't believe ultimately that there's any controlling person so it's it's a death deathful philosophy it it gives emptiness emptiness to the soul people are completely dissatisfied and they have no ultimate moral principle they don't they don't believe that there's any ultimate regulated principle they don't even have fear of god because they don't believe in any ultimate god so then we get the modern situation where people think that 
It's not only all right to do whatever you like, but that's what you should be doing. Everyone should just indulge their senses as much as possible. And we find that in the Buddhist countries, Buddhism is mayavad with a with extra petrol or something. It's mayavad plus. That uh, even though if they actually follow what what the orthodox Buddhist sects say, they should be quite austere, but. Definitely they should be vegetarian, but in the in the Buddhist countries we find that they eat their eating habits are the most degraded in the world. Of course beef eating is that's degraded, but anyway they eat you know, snakes, rats, monkeys and live grasshoppers and all kinds of things. And uh sexually in, in the in Thailand, which is the where they have this Theravad Buddhism, which is like real hardcore orthodox Buddhism, really totally, totally voidistic. Other strains of Buddhism, they're somewhat compromised with semi-theism, but Theravad Buddhism is just, it's real, it's shunya, shunya and shunya, but the people are the biggest sense enjoyers in the world. It's famous. That's why people go all over the world. The tourists go to Thailand to enjoy their senses. It's a, so this, by saying that there's nothing, there's no, this impersonalism that nothing, ultimately everything is nothing and there's no real purpose, and the people just become animals. The, the, human being lives, means that they live by a higher principle. But even though they talk of that the highest reality is Brahman, but it's, not only is it intangible, we can't really conceive of it, but even the, it, it's not even a very desirable goal. It's, it's suicide. It's suicide for the soul. It's just, just like people when they can't find any solution to their problem, sometimes they commit suicide. People, have, it's quite common in India at the present time due to demoniac government policies that farmers are given loans so that they can buy genetically manipulated seeds and fertilizers and all this kind of things. So they have a huge loan. And then when the crop fails, which it often does, then they have no way to pay back except by selling their lands, which is what the demons want. And uh, they just commit suicide, with their, sometimes with their whole families. It's common. It's like, you know, all over India, it's several thousand farmers a month for the last few years. It's, then they'll clear all the lands and McDonald's and Kellogg's will buy it all up and you know, life goes on like this. And then they're, they're forcibly throwing people off the lands, even in communist Bengal. They're acting like the biggest capitalists. They're forcibly, by force, get off your land so that we can build factories. That's what they're doing. So suicide is the it's the ultimate resort for people who are frustrated. Of course, it doesn't really help them because they become ghosts. But the, the, this spiritual suicide, where you have no, you don't have any faith in material prospect, prospect your material prospects. And you don't have any faith. You don't have enough piety to accept that there's any god who I should pray to. So they commit spiritual suicide and with the idea, we shall merge into the oneness of everything, or we, I shall become everything. But it doesn't satisfy the soul. And even, even if that's their goal, to attain it, you have to go through such difficult, unpleasurable process, just a lot of austerities and... <coughs> There's no ananda in the simply s studying Buddhist scriptures or impersonalistic Vedic scriptures. There's no ananda in performing lots of austerities. So, we just like I was in Thailand for some time, and we we find people are completely enjoying their senses, and the whole aim of the country is the whole aim of Thai culture is sanuk, which means sense enjoyment. 
Everything they do is, they, they have no bashfulness about it. They, they, they just want to enjoy themselves, that's all. Because the, the aim of their supposed religion is not very desirable, and the process to attain it also is not desirable. And even if you follow all these austerities and everything, even then it's very difficult to attain it. So they just, end, well, we might as well just enjoy ourselves here, because, damn it, we're not going to, you know, that process is so difficult, and what do you want to become nothing for anyway? So they're just enjoying themselves in the, in the most gross way. One time I asked a, a Thai woman, that, see, you're eating pork, that's the most popular food. I mean, they do eat rats and snakes and grasshoppers, but... Pork is the most popular food. So you're eating pork. Don't you know you'll become a pig in your next life? She said, yes. Aren't you afraid of that? And she said, no, no, we'll also enjoy ourselves as a pig. So this is the result of Mayavad. Shankaracharya came to increase the unwanted population. So this... This scientific impersonalism is underpinning the whole present modern society. And a sociologist or anthropologist, they could study present India and Bangladesh and all these countries and see how rapidly they're changing from a society with, whose culture was, until the last generation, still very much traditional. And the present generation, they're very much westernized. And it, it's such a rapid change that they're just being indoctrinated by the TV and the educational system. And they're becoming westernized with all the problems that go with it. They have all the same... So in, in Bangalore, where the, the, which is the famous for its economic development and the software, engineering, and the mental hospitals are doing great business. So many people are having nervous breakdowns. But they don't think that, well, we should go back to our own culture. What's the, what's the use of all this development if we simply become literally crazy? But they're pushing it on because andhaya tandhaya rupaniyamanas. The, the blind are following the blind. So Prabhupada, he spoke very strongly that this civilization is not civilization. It's simply a collection of, of cats and dogs who think that someone is civilized because they have money and a, sh and a coat and a shirt. They think, that I, you'll see, it's ridiculous. Here in India, now it's not hot. The heat should start any time now. But people, they'll be walking around in Calcutta in the heat, wearing this polyester shirt and pants, which is, like, it is just in, very uncomfortable. Especially in the heat, makes you sweat like anything. But their own national dress is just perfect. This kadi cloth, cotton, it's very cool. But they feel that this is below my dignity. They couldn't, they, don't, they never even imagined to wear that, even though it's so much more comfortable and suitable for the weather. But they think it's uncivilized. Actually, their own culture is civilized. But they're indoctrinated to th all the worst things for human society. They, by their foolishness, they're adopting because they think it's better. Somehow they think it's better. They don't, the people don't think at all. Modern education trains you how to become a uh, an, an educated ass, how to be a, a great fool. And people are proud of having university degrees. But the university degree is just a certificate that I am a, uh, a more competent ass than those who don't have it. It's actually a... They've written books how the American educational system was deliberately... The, it was, it was designed how to make people into workers who will work a lot, 
with the aim to make money and spend a lot. Because unless you you have to, to produce a lots of goods, and unless people are in the mood of of spending, then what's the, you then you can't go on making your business. So actually, the whole educational system is designed to make people into fools and be proud of it. It's actually designed like that. So it's very difficult to uh, to convince people of their foolishness, even though it's it's manifest in in just simple things like that, walking around in the heat with clothes that are just intensely uncomfortable, and work people are living in the country, and even today, at least in Bangladesh, there are people who they hardly have any money. But they have land, and they produce their own rice and vegetables, and you know they're pulling on. They're not rich, but they have all that they need. It's produced by the land. There are still plenty of people like that. But in India now, that's becoming gradually imp- that was how people were living until recently. That's becoming gradually impossible because the economic system doesn't allow it. And everyone now they're pushing. Everyone has to go to school. All the children have to go to school. So. When they go to school, they'll be indoctrinated to think that the farmer's life is below their dignity. Everyone has to live in the city, and they'd rather live in some slum with the, with the rats running around in the drains and with with. But they'll have all the all the slum houses. Those of you who are from the West, you don't know what slum means in Indian. It's the, the slums in the West are. They don't have them much now anymore, actually. In the communist countries, they never had them practically, and then the, but they don't. They've cleared the slums now. They have all high-rise, low-cost apartments. But in India, they have still people who live in shacks made out of literally out of garbage, and and and, and like you know, you'll have, you fly into Bombay Airport from the southern side. And you'll see kilometers of kilometers of tiny little shacks. People live in, in like thirty families will share one toilet, and, and there's no water in the summer. Also, only for one hour a day or something. So, so but people would rather live like, in among all those shacks. They have a beauty parlor, <laughs> and they have uh, video. Everyone's got a TV, and they have their video shop, and they watch all kinds of videos. So, when they come home from working in the factory, so they think this is very nice. In the country, they have fresh air, fresh food, but they think this is below my dignity. Srila Prabhupada he instructed Srila Lokanath Maharaj to take the at that time wasn't called Padyatras, the bullock cart program. Go village to village and chant Hare Krishna. And no big philosophy. Just tell people stay in the village, be content, and chant Hare Krishna. They don't need any big philosophy. Just if they can take that, that's enough. But a generation has gone on since then, and times have changed. Now there's some serious move. At least some devotees in India are trying to start. Farm communities, as Prabhupada wanted. Of course, there was something started in India while Prabhupada was here. There was some, at least some lands were got in, near Hyderabad and near Ahmedabad, but they were never developed along the lines Prabhupada wanted to do so. Now, some devotees are trying to make some farm projects in India on the lines of Prabhupada. So it's very difficult to get anyone to go to them because they're in the same urban consciousness as people in the West. That we should live in the city and. This is civilized, and they think it's below their dignity to live in the country and live simply and not have lots of money and not send your children to an expensive school. They think it's below their dignity. So all this, all the, what, the underlying principle of the, of this misled civilization, in, products of whom are very difficult to bring to Krishna consciousness, even though this movement of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is so nice that simply by chanting Hare Krishna, everyone can achieve the highest perfection. 
It's not difficult. It's very easy. You chant Hare Krishna, take prasadam. No need to work very hard. No need to have an MSc, PhD, all this kind of thing. But it's very difficult to bring people to this because there's so much propaganda that there's no God or the religious inclination is just the mistake of some wrongly programmed genes or that they left over from some evolutionary process or, and it's it's just something that should it should fade away as man evolves more of course it doesn't that the Soviet regime they tried to propagate that well there's no God so if there's if it's logical that there's no God and the society was freed from the misteaching of the churches, then within two or three generations of the Soviet regime, then everyone in that regime, they should understand that when religion, it's, it's just nonsense. If, it's, if it is as they say it is, that it's just something which has been propagated by people to exploit others, Karl Marx's theory, the the opiate of the people. But we find that despite their determined efforts to crush religion and replace it with atheism, that people in Russia are at least as much inclined to believe in God, probably more so than in other places. Which suggests that it's not just because some people are making some wrong propaganda, but there is an innate need for people to believe in God. And that example is there that just like physically, we feel the need to, believe, to drink water. Because we feel the need because it, it fulfills a vital need for our body. So in the same way, the feeling that we need to believe in God suggests that we have, there is a vital necessity for that. It, it can't be physically defined because belief in God by its very nature is metaphysical anyway. So to try to disprove it on grounds of that there's no physical need for it, is, it's... Ridiculous. It's like saying, you know, there's no need for there's no need for measures, this ruler, thirty centimeter, because uh, you can't measure the specific density of liquids with it. Or you can't you can't measure weight with it, so it's useless. But it's, you can measure something with it, but you have to know how to apply it. It's, because you don't know how to apply it, because you're a fool, doesn't mean that it has no specific use. So anyway, Srila Prabhupada was very interested that this science, as it's being propagated in the world today, that should be shown for the cheating that it is. Srila Prabhupada said, and this is the mid-1970s, that the cheating of the scientists will be finished in 50 years. So, about half of that, a little bit more than half of those 50 years have gone. And there is at the present time very strong uh, reaction against the, the point that Prabhupada was making so uh, so often and so strongly that this theory of evolution that man has evolved or life has evolved by chance from chemicals that is being very seriously challenged but cha challenged no actually not that the, 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 what's being challenged is the that's a subsidiary theory or one that follows on from the idea that the universe has come into being by chance so this is being very seriously contested. It's a major controversy in the scientific world at the present time. Although you won't find it in the classrooms yet. They're still teaching. They're teaching that everything comes into being by 
by chance. But there are mainstream scientists, and not just a few, many, who are challenging this with the intelligent design theory, which the which the evolutionary theorists say, well, it's just a covered belief in God. And actually it is. Intelligent... There are reputable scientists who say that all the data, or all the observations that we have made about the universe, they do not support the idea of the universe coming into being by chance but that everything can be explained without, alterate, without altering what we perceive. Everything can be explained by saying that there's an intelligent designer. And the evolutionary theorists, they can't just get away with... They used to just ignore it or poo-poo it. Who's translating in Bengali? Poo-poo it? How do you say that in Bengali? Poo-poo it means to just say it's just, ah, nonsense. Dismiss it. Summarily dismiss it. That's more formal English way of saying it. So, but they can't do that anymore because there are real scientists with, with rep- reputable careers who are presenting in scientific terms that intelligent design theory is more uh, feasible than the idea that the universe came into being by chance. Actually, Prabhupada wanted that our ISKCON scientists would do this, that, that to present in scientific terms the Bhagavat philosophy of how the universe exists. Yasyaika nishvasitam kalamatava lamyam jivanti loma vilajaja garandana taha vishnur mahansa eha yasya kala vishesha govinda madi purusham tamaham vajami. Ultimately, the, the universe is where do they come from? From the body of Mahavishnu in seed form with his each breathing. The universe is coming out in seed form and they come back in again. So to prove that there is a that there is God in control. Actually, Prabhupada he was stressing more on the on the evolution point. That on both points, but he specifically wanted to show that it's impossible that life can come into being by matter. He used to say that our scientists They should go all over the world and hold conferences challenging the scientists on two points. One point is that you never went to the moon. And number two, that the chicken is a better scientist than you. Because you say you will produce life in future, but the chicken lays an egg every day. And there's life there. So the chicken, you're saying you'll do in future, but the chicken's doing it every day. So Prabhupada was, he was not overawed by these mundane so-called intellectuals. He didn't think that they were that they had anything, that they had any grounds to stand on. He wanted to he didn't go and lick their boots but he wanted to I said I'll kick them. I want to kick on them for their misleading people. So he was in a very aggressive mood in the spirit of Hanuman, they were asking something about Ram Lila, so I mentioned Hanuman. In the spirit of Hanuman, who wanted to serve Ram by destroying the enemies of Ram. So, this science, and it's masquerading as the as the pinnacle of human civilization, but it's actually the the debacle of human civilization. Prabhupada wanted to to defeat this and show this is wrong. Life cannot come into being by chance. The universe cannot come into being by chance. Nothing comes into being by chance. There is no 
Ultimately, there is no chance. Everything is under the control of Krishna. Ishvara sarva bhutanam hridesha arjuna tishtati. Brahmayan sarva bhutani yantra arutani maya. We're all on. We're all on the machine of which the controller is the supreme personality of Godhead. So Srila Prabhupada wanted that his disciples would do this, or in their absence, others are taking it up. We can postulate that it's a side effect of the distribution of so many of Prabhupada's books. Prabhupada, he always said that by distributing his books that the change will take place in human society. People will we will come to realize that when they read these books that they're being cheated, that all that you're taught in school is simply, it's simply cheating. That what you're taught at school, it's not just history, geography, mathematics, but along with it goes the idea that by dedicating our life to material progress, that is the fulfillment of our lives. That is the cheating. This is a personal observation, but it seems to me that nowadays most, many if not most of our devotees in ISKCON also somehow or other they, they try to believe this and be Krishna conscious at the same time. That it's, we find most of our grihasas are very interested for their children to be very good material successes and they should, they even propagate a thing like you have to become a material, you should be materially successful and it's good for preaching. Good for preaching what, I wonder? That in between, to become a material success, you have to dedicate your life and work hard and concentrate on your career. So in between doing that, you might be able to jabber a few Hare Krishnas, but that's not, you don't have the time to do the sadhana that's required to become Krishna conscious. That's why Prabhupada wanted to start farm communities because modern life, people will force you to, modern leaders will force you to work like dogs and hogs, dogs and cats and hogs, Prabhupada said. So there's no time to even think about becoming God conscious. Prabhupada, he said, the main reason I want to start the farm communities is so that people have time for practicing Krishna consciousness. But if you're working like a dog or a hog or a cat and thinking I'm very successful, then you don't have time for Krishna consciousness and you can preach to others to become a fool like me and work like an ass and while you're doing it to, to try and cram in a few Hare Krishnas. In between. But that's not what Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to teach. It's not what Prabhupada taught us. and It, it might be a good program for attracting many so-called successful people, but it's not a very good program for fulfilling Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission of sending people back to Godhead. It's a sellout. So, Srila Prabhupada was, he was very much aware of the condition of modern society and of all the misconceptions that are its supports. And he spoke constantly against this. Some people foolishly think that, well, Prabhupada wasn't such a high-level devotee because he wasn't always talking about Rasalila. In fact, he didn't speak about Rasalila very much at all. But he spoke what we needed to hear. We need to hear again and again and again that we're not the body, that we have no relationship with this material world. This idea of being a material success is just... It's a form of cheating to divert our attention away from the real purpose of human life, which is to become Krishna conscious. If we don't hear this again and again and again, then uh, we're going to be sucked in by the materialistic civilization because constantly there's propaganda. Even people don't speak to you, but you just walk on the street the way people are dressed. That's also a kind of preaching. They're dressing, yes, I'm an enjoyer of the material world. This is the way we should be. So in the whole society, the, ho the whole atmosphere is surcharged with intense materialism. So unless we very clearly, strongly and repeatedly point out the fault in this, then we're going to be victimized by it. And we can talk of Rasalila, but 
you know, in between our rushing off to work and eating some potato chips, which we may or may not remember to offer before we throw it down our throats, and think that we are highly advanced devotees, and Prabhupada didn't really know what to teach us. But well, he was nice, but anyway, now we've got something better in between our potato chips. So Prabhupada, he was quite aware of everything in the material world and the spiritual world. He was quite aware of our situation and what we need and what the whole of human society needs to be Krishna conscious. Which is why we have to be conscious of what Prabhupada gave us and not be think that we know better or that times have changed and so we have to do something different. Actually, times have changed. Things have got worse. But the, the whole society has become more materialistic. So then maybe we should preach more strongly against all the errors of the modern human society. For sure, Prabhupada, this whole section of Bhagavatam, he explained in great detail what is the nature of the, how this material world is working under the direction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. How we should see that. Krishna consciousness means to see Krishna in everything. We can see how he's working through the material nature. Whereas this scientist looks at material nature and sees, oh, evolution. I was telling you this article Anyway, I won't say. It's a little bit vulgar, so I won't say. I can say it privately. But they have such bizarre theories about how... They, they see, oh yeah, this tree is here. This, this, they see evolution. They st science means to study all the intricate laws of nature and then come to the totally illogical conclusion that everything is happening by chance. They, they'll, they'll write out all complex mathematical formulae that govern the universe and say it all comes into being by chance. It's amazing how foolish they can be and be convinced of it. Well, that's the power of Maya. And it's the duty of devotees to be convinced that... Srimad Bhagavatam is the actual knowledge for guiding human society. And that the atheistic theories, they are the, although they're propagated as the progress of human society, as Prabhupada said, it is the darkest hour of human civilization. He said that. This movement will go down in history for having saved humankind in its, in its darkest hours. So we're thinking this is progress, this is wonderful. We have, we have the metro in Calcutta. And we, now we're very progressive and we don't believe that boys and girls shouldn't mix up. And what's the problem? We have plenty of abortion clinics. So it's the, they're thinking what it's advanced. But it's the most sinful and wretched condition of human society. And people are, are suffering and they can see their suffering but still they're so foolish that they think this, they, instead of seeing that we're suffering because we're not following the laws of God because we're sinful, because we're trying to indulge in sense gratification which causes suffering, they're so foolish that they think that the cause of our suffering is because we don't have enough sense gratification, so they try to get more, which makes their condition worse. And this all comes from Freud's foolish ideas, which comes from Darwin's foolish ideas. So Prabhupada cut at the root of all these bogus ideas by giving his Bhaktivedanta purports. So, as Manida Prabhu would say, better distribute these books. <laughs> That will make the difference. But we ourselves have to be convinced. Otherwise, we won't want to distribute the books or even people come to the temples and we'll tell them, yes, yes, be a material success, very good. And you try and squeeze in a little, little bhakti at the same time. Someone may come and say, well, I'm a successful company manager and 
I have five cars and three houses. And we can say to them, well, never mind, you can still turn Hare Krishna. It's, we, we sympathize with your misfortune, but nevertheless you can still turn Hare Krishna. So it's not impossible, even in such a fallen condition, you can still turn Hare Krishna. We shouldn't think, oh, yes, sir. yes, yes, sir, all right, very good. You should understand them. And the, as of course, such people don't come to the temple anyway. They're dana dhurmadandhan. They're blinded. They're mad and blinded by their wealth. You know this from Srimad Bhagavatam? Dana dhurmadandha. Kasmad bhajanti kavayo dana dhurmadandha. Why should, Shukadev Goswami said, why should, why should learn, people who are actually learned, why should they be enamored by this people who, are, who themselves are foolishly enamored by their so-called wealth? If you have knowledge, if you have actual knowledge, then why should you be enamored by anyone's so-called material progress? That actually means that you don't have any knowledge if we're enamored by all these things. Once Prabhupada, this Shama Sundar, his Prabhupada's secretary, who, oh, so I just remember now, it's, it's a meaningless thing to say. Anyway, I dreamt of him. Also. So, it's auspicious to dream of devotees. So, he once, he, were, he had, he had a string of pearls worth thousands of dollars. And he was doing some business with that. So he came and put it on Prabhupada's neck. Prabhupada wore it for some time. He said, Prabhupada, they said, oh, no, 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 you take it. He's not. Wore it for a few minutes. What is that? Samalo Strashma Kamchanad in Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna says twice. A self realized person, for him, stone, which is worth nothing, and gold, it's all the same. Not enamored. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Any questions, please, or comments?